William Castle is one of those cinematic flavors I haven't dabbled too much in, oddly enough. Um, you'd think, but no. Of course, I'd seen House on Haunted Hill, but most of his filmography was uh, sort of foreign to me. This is the Fright Break. The gimmickry was just, it seemed to encapsulate what I would be getting into, so I never got around to watching the movies themselves. Uh, this, it turns out, was a mistake. And one I learned I'd made while watching Castle's final directorial effort, 1974's Shanks. I don't have the Blu-ray with me because a friend is borrowing it, but I assure you, I have it. It's, uh, Kino, I think. Fuck. No, it's not Kino. It is Olive. <sighs> Shanks stars Marcel Marceau, a French mime so famous that despite being a fucking mime, you probably already know his name. Uh, Marceau was brilliantly cast here as a sort of, I don't know why I did the Trump fingers. <laughs> he's got, he's the biggest mime, the best mime. We're gonna cut this. Marceau was brilliantly cast here as a sort of final gimmick for Castle. Not only does Marceau bring with him a certain celebrity and bodily movement to the titular role of deaf mute Malcolm Shanks, but he even portrays two separate characters, the other being the elderly scientist who introduces him to the whacked out science behind the film. Essentially, what happens is that Shanks is hired on by the scientist, uh, the scientist dies, and Shanks uses these wireless pins here and a small dial device to control corpses through electric signals. It's utter bullshit. But then, that's science in the castle verse, baby. The performances are about as bizarre as the conceit, with Marceau himself coming off as incredibly creepy for a large chunk of the running time, uh, despite... I did it again. I did it again. Did the Trump fingers again. Tie my fucking hands to my knees. Take two. Mark. With Marceau himself coming off as incredibly creepy for a large chunk of the running time, despite his seemingly being a good, downtrodden guy. His brother and sister-in-law are antagonists for a good bit of the picture, played by Philippe Clay and Scylla Shelton, are cartoonish in their cruelty. They are not subtle, for this is not a subtle picture. It is, however, a picture with lots of gin. Mmm. Nothing like nothing like drinking straight gin just all, all day long. Mmm. Yummy yummy. Trying to take my gin, huh? It's a work of dream logic where this dinky device can do something like this. Make the dead literally dance. It is, as the opening title card says, a grim fairy tale. Composer Alex North, here earning his 12th Oscar nomination, reused portions of his rejected score for 2001 A Space Odyssey to great effect in Shanks. That grim fairy tale vibe is given a sort of ethereal reality, uh, while also delving into more childish tunes and dark soundscapes. I'm not much of a music aficionado, obviously, but the point is, the score works. It fucks hard even lending credence to some of Shank's more outlandish moments, such as when one character is attacked by a, um... Well, a zombie rooster. The third act contains the only major negative for me. It's a finale that comes out of absolutely nowhere, literally crashing into our narrative. It's not a bad addition necessarily, but it's one without any setup and therefore it feels too ridiculous, even for a dancing corpse movie. What's more, it's treated as if it makes sense, as if we're, we've like met or known these characters prior to their intrusion. Thematically, I kinda get where Castle or writer Ronald Graham was coming from. As the poster says, the good come out of the grave and the evil are sent to fill the vacancy. It's just too bad that's really not explored in the film itself, even considering the borderline Boxing Helena style ending. Spoilers, I guess, for this movie? It, it's, it's weird, there's, there's no spoiling it. It's 
Shanks is by no means a great film, but it is one of those curiosities that you kind of have to see once, and from there you just have to decide if the overall what the fuckery was worth your time. I, I think it is. Between the history, the performances, and just the high concept bullshit at the center, there's plenty to sink your zombie Bluetooth pins into. Uh, the new 4K set from Cinematograph, uh, the it looks like a bit of overkill, in my opinion, but if you dig Shanks, well, here's that centerpiece you asked for. Uh, the audio commentary and archival material are certainly appreciated, uh, as are the subtitles, but I think I'll keep my Kino Blu-ray, or whatever the fuck... Whatever the fuck that Blu-ray is from that I have lying around. <laughs> I think it's Olive. I think it's Olive put it out. <laughs> Still, very cool to see such a bizarro flick get the royal treatment. Good, good job, OCN. It's okay. This review did give me the bright idea to delve through the most notable William Castle flicks, all of which I watched thanks to <clears throat> thanks <sighs> to these beautiful sets from Indicator. Look how sexy these are. Oh my god. <laughs> I'm a little high right now. These are the William Castle at Columbia, volumes one and two. Uh, volume one is, I believe, all region, and I believe volume two is just region B. I'm mistaken. The only one that's region B is Straight Jacket on volume two. Everything else is region free, so if you have uh, a chance to catch these on eBay or something, uh, they are very much worth the price, I assume. I don't know how much they're going for now, but uh, they are pretty rad sets. Let's start uh, with The Tingler. Our Lady of The Tingler is in the theater. I warned the audience. No. The Tingler is, I think, the most famous gimmick in Castle's oeuvre, uh, but what I appreciate about it is how little that gimmick interrupts the flow of the film itself. For me, it'll always be the one where Vincent Price plays the real sack of shit fear scientist actively getting cucked by his banging wife. It's also got some legitimately creepy imagery when its characters are in their nightmare states. Uh, the Tingler itself is a little meh, but the red blood in the deaf mute wife's nightmare? Mwah, ugh. Oh. Beautiful, excellent, love it. The way the gimmick is integrated is also pretty clever. One of the primary locations is a movie theater where the Tingler is set loose, giving us this excellent moment, as well as some black screen moments that I'd love to experience in an actual theater. No, you'd start a panic. These moments allowed for a little extra fright for theaters at the time or at revival screenings uh, because there were little buzzers on the back of the seats to make your butt go, Ugh! And uh, I think that's neat. I would like my butt to go uh, during a screening of The Tingler at some point in my life. I just saw a lion and a man without a head. What did you see last night? 13 Ghosts was less impressive, feeling at times like a lame 50s sitcom more than an actual horror film. Uh, still, it was fun to watch, uh, and that's kind of the thread that seems to link all of Castle's work. Uh, in this instance, it's fun to watch this family contend with the mysteries of their new haunted residence. Uh, I had a pair of 3D glasses on hand, which allowed me to partake in the Illusiono scenes. Uh, they're not great. But the schlockiness was appreciated, and you bet your sweet ass I looked for the ghosts every time. The bitter irony of it appealed to me and I took Sardonicus as my name. Then there was Mr. Sardonicus, a period piece about a prestigious doctor who travels to a fictional Eastern European country to aid the titular Baron Sardonicus, who has married an old flame of the doctors. Uh, Sardonicus is a creepy masked aristocrat with a ghoulish deformity portrayed by Guy Rolfe in a performance that feels more reserved for someone like the Tingler's Vincent Price. Uh, the real standout, though, is Oscar Homolka as the manservant Kroll. Very good, sir. Uh, Sardonicus, like Shanks, feels like Castle trying to stretch out and create something more atmospheric and serious, not unlike what he'd try a few years later with Rosemary's Baby, which he had wanted to direct before Roman Polanski was given the job by producer Robert Evans. Uh, 
Paramount, baby. I think you're afraid of me, Helga. You wouldn't want me to go away, would you? Leave you all alone? Who would feed you? Put you to bed? You'd dry up. Now, immediately after, I checked out Homicidal, which is the fourth disc in that four-disc volume one set. And I only knew this one previously as William Castle's riff on Psycho. I didn't realize, really, or even know anything about, about it. Just that this was him riffing on Psycho. Now, while the Tingler is easily the archetypal William Castle picture, I think that this is the one I'll be revisiting the most. Uh, part of that might be in how much it unabashedly steals from Hitchcock, who was himself pulling a William Castle with his promotion for Psycho. Then there's the lead performance by Joan Marshall, whose characterization blends the two most iconic performances from Psycho into a gloriously wackadoo concoction. Why don't you have some milk? Calm you down. Finally, I went over to volume two. Now, volume two also contains The Old Dark House, 13 Frightened Girls, and Zots. Um, I've watched 13 Frightened Girls before. Um, it's fine. Uh, it's a perfectly good little uh, dumb comedy. I have not watched The Old Dark House and I've not watched Zots, but I did watch Straight Jacket, uh, AKA the one with Joan Crawford. Uh, in the way that Homicidal riffed on Psycho, here we have a combo of Psycho and essentially whatever happened to Baby Jane. Bonus points, uh, the script was written by Blocker, Blocker, I almost said Blocker Rock. Take three. Mark. Bonus points, the script was written by Robert Block, who of course penned the novel Psycho was based on. Well. Crawford plays an axe-wielding psycho broad who kills her cheating husband and his mistress and is released from the asylum 20 years later to meet her now grown-up daughter a sculptor living on a farm and set to get hitched to a more wealthy farmer's son. The big twist is even easier to work out than it is in Homicidal, but that doesn't detract from the fun here. Seeing Joan Crawford light a match off a spinning vinyl record will be with me forever. And the whole story is a clever take on mother-daughter relationship dynamics. Young George Kennedy shows up for a bit and he's about as sleazy as he could ever conceivably be. In one of his scenes, there's a possible influence on John Carpenter's Halloween as well. Hey you two, why all the silence back there? I think Diane Baker really holds her own against Crawford's broad performance. Broad because she's a lady. No, broad as in it's, oh, she's over the top. Oh, I distracted myself. Take four. Mark. Action. I think Diane Baker really holds her own against Crawford's uh, broad approach, which is notable because by all accounts, Crawford did not make that easy. Uh, there are some stellar fake outs amidst the drawn out juicy murder sequences. I think Castle was a far better director than anyone gave him credit for, especially with all these wonderful female performances and his shot economy. His shot economy is really good. A lot of two shots. I love a good two shot. Um, a recurring theme in Castle's work is the human desire for money, more so what that need does to a human being, whether it's allowing oneself to be subjected to the horrors of a haunted house, or digging up one's father's grave, or even pretending to be a stranger's husband. It's powerful stuff, though as we see in 13 Ghosts, it doesn't always end in tragedy. In that way, it's a pragmatic sort of view. Money isn't evil, but it will bring out the best or worst in a person, and often via some horrific means. In the case of Homicidal, it's the backbone of the whole plot. Now, what really surprised me is just how violent Castle's films could be, at least for the time. Homicidal and Straightjacket specifically are pretty darn horrific, like there's some serious gru going on. It's not going to satiate the, the Terrifier crowd, but for early 60s schlock, wowza. These two volumes are sadly out of print, but some of the titles are still available as individual standard editions through Indicator. And I gotta say, after watching these castle joints and firmly enjoying myself, I hope that we get something as immaculate as the Shanks 4K for his older work. Maybe someone could pull a Severin and include a Tingler with the Tingler. Or, uh, I don't know, a Joan Crawford with Straightjacket. Just... Toss her corpse in there. Have a good time. I look forward to uh, enjoying more William Castle joints and uh, enjoying these for many, many years to come. Just a, a wonderful director. And uh, that's all I got for that. Oh, also, 
I have a Patreon. If you would like to join the Patreon and give me monies to produce more content like this, uh, except better, eh, 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 then uh, go on over to my Patreon and become a patron. G. Willikers. Go watch a movie. Take